Okay, um, thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm so happy we were able to get together to do this learning, and I wanted to dedicate our learning tonight. Ilu Nishmat of Hacham Yehoshua Nataneli. His your site is coming. Um, I think the da um, the daughter said to me 23rd of Kislev. Like it's this Shabbat will be the Shabbat. So he was a um, one of the first religious like Rabbanim, even though like I went to a religious high school, but he was someone that really made a connection for me and to Judaism. Like I feel like it really makes a difference when you find a Rav or a Rabbitson or like they talk the language that sits in your heart. And it's so interesting because we have a woman's um, Parsha class that we do on Shabbat and Baruch Hashem it's been a year and it's dedicated to the woman of the community and we all get together and I was debating trying to work it out and it happened that this Shabbat I said I want to do it this Shabbat and later I find out that this was the sh this is the Shabbat of his your side and like nothing in life is by chance that like the person that had one of the greatest impact on me to come more on the path and grow and practice like I end up having a learning in my home on that Shabbat that it's in in that is for his memorial um, I really truly believe that like when people pass away they kind of like end physically but their neshama and their energy and their light continues and the more we're involved in the Gashmut physical world, we cannot access that. But when you're able to like step back and see the world more from like a spiritual perspective, you'll know that there is more to life than the lifespan that we're on earth. Like it just can't be that we just come and go. And I think this is one of the reasons with the parashiot or the Torah that we have. Why is it that every year we keep repeating the same parashiot more and more? Because it's trying to teach us even though Abraham lived so many years ago or Yitzchak lived so many years ago, their soul and the, the light of what they brought into this world stays with us till this day. Even though they passed and they were born years ago, but the Torah and their personality and their midot are with us now. And I was telling my husband another crazy thing that happened was that when I googled Hacham's name because I was trying to look for a picture of him, I Google it, I see a picture, and then YouTube brings the videos. What's the parasha that he talks about? By Yishev. Like, that is not by chance. That is not by chance that the Shabbat, that it's his Shabbat. I put his name in Google, on social media. Google links it to Hacham Yehoshua Nataneli. He has so many different videos. Like, YouTube knows what Parsha we're in. Like that's never happened to me that I put someone's name and they, that and YouTube brings me exactly that person's name with the Parsha, and it, it, it's really twisted. And like um, Yosef is one of my like I was telling my husband, I don't know, am I allowed to say character? You know, like I don't know what to like one of the leaders in the Torah that I really like admire and. I'm fascinated by his personality is Yosef. Like if I had to um, say like how I, I aspire to be like, it would be for me, it would be Yosef and also Rachel and Miriam. Like those Moshe, they all have their stories and midot, but there's just something so amazing about Yosef that really sits with me. So um, one of the things that um, Hacham Natanelli was saying is that Yosef, despite of all the Nisayonot that he went through, he was a very, very compassionate person. His consideration and compassion never ended. And he said when Yaakov went to meet Esau for the first time, he set up all his wives. The wives were in the front and the kids were in the back. So Zilpa, Bila, um, Leah, and Rachel. So all of them, the mothers were in the front. But when Esau came to meet Le Rachel, Yosef right away came and then stood right in front of his mom. He was six years old. And Hacham Natanelli was saying, Yosef was a very deep thinker. He thought to himself, my mom Rachel is so beautiful. She has only one son. All of them have either two or Leah has six. How can I let her stand in front of him by himself? I'm going to stand right in front of my mom that if he even decides to do anything, it should happen to me, not my mom. Like from the age of six years old, he had that compassion. 
And he said a story that when they would go on the field to work the land, Leah's kids would like publicly say, you guys are the kids of our my mom's main servant. We don't even have to like farm with you. We don't want to have anything to do with you. And Yosef would go and say, you are the ones I want to be with. And he would tell Leah's kids that Hashem made a decree that our father should marry the four wives. We are nowhere to decide who's more important, who's less important. But one thing I can tell you is we have no place to shatter anyone's heart. To hurt people's feelings, to put people down is not something we have a right to. So it's not my place to say I am more special than you. And he would say, you guys are the ones I want to farm with. You guys are the ones that I want to be close to. And he was very obedient of his father. Whatever his father said, he did. Um, however, one of the lessons we learned is that the jealousy that was created amongst them because Yaakov publicly favored him amongst the brother is something that we need to work on not doing with our kids. Because what happens if when you do act of favorism, especially publicly in front of your other kids, what you create is jealousy. And jealousy leads to hatred. And hatred leads to sinat chinam. That like, that, that, that this distance feeling and resentment that they will have amongst each other that we cannot solve. So uh, our role as parents is not to create sinat chinam, it's to create ahavat chinam, to just have baseless love amongst them. So we don't want to publicly favor one in front of the other. So I was asking Rabbi Yaakov um, Busuri on the shoe I went to on Tuesday, I said, but what if there's midot that you see? And you're like, that's awesome. Like, you know, so he was saying how you should present it is ag acknowledge the attribute. Not to say, um, Debbie, look how good Dina is in that. That you say, Dina, I really appreciate how you patient you are right now. So it's not like you're trying to favor Dina over that. But let's say if they're all like hanging on you, pulling on your skirt, saying that, and one of them is like quietly sitting on the side. You say that at the Mida, you point out the Mida, you say, Dina, I really appreciate your patience right now. You're sitting and waiting so patiently. I appreciate that. So you're not saying, Debbie and David, look at Dina. All you're doing is you're um, simply acknowledging the Midot. And especially when we have those kids that are more strong-willed, even with them, we want to find out what Mida can I point out from them. And it could be simple things that I really appreciate that when I talk with you, you look at me. I really appreciate when we're walking, you wait for us to walk together. I really appreciate that when you like want to sit down, you make sure that, you know, and one of the things I even do, even when my, th my kids ever thank me, I tell them, I really appreciate that manners. I really appreciate that you said thank you. Or if I'm serving dinner and I say, this is what we have for dinner. And my daughter might say, this is not my taste, Ima, but thank you for making it. I say, wow, that's such nice manners. You acknowledge for what was good and you simply said, it's not my taste. Because we have to understand that as parents, um, as parents, we have a responsibility. Whatever we teach our kids, they will magnify it. And I was saying that we learned from the story of Adam and Chava, when God came and told Adam, Adam, what did you do? Why did you eat from the tree of knowledge? So accountability was zero. What did Adam say? Ad Adam said, Hashem, the wife that you gave me made me eat from the tree, right? So God goes over to Chava, says, Chava, what did you do? So now Chava hears what Adam says. So what does Chava says? Again, the blame game. What do you mean? The snake that you made came and convinced me to eat from the tree. So then you have the sons, Cain and Havel, right? So Cain, I think it was Cain that killed Havel, right? Yeah. So God comes and says, Kain, where is your brother? Now the level of the chutzpah, like, you know, they went and they said, you know, this one, that one. What does he say? What? You think I'm the mother's watcher? So you see that the level of chutzpah goes higher and higher 
and the level of mitzvah, of consideration of Yosef. You see what Rachel did for the sister, Yosef did for his brothers. So whatever midot and attribute, if whether it's through the chutzpah or through the good, our kids magnify it. They like glorify it even more so. So Yosef was a man of consideration. He had a lot of consideration and patience. And one of the things that first Nathaneli also said, there's four parashiot about Yosef in the Torah. We learn about his story for four different parashiot. Second, we learn about him being a tzaddik. And one of the biggest temptation that he overcame was Potiphar's wife. He said when Potiphar, my daughter was saying this story so cute. He's like, Ima, when Potiphar went to the party, um, his wife ran after Yosef to marry him. He kept running after him and saying, I want to marry you. I want to marry you. And Yosef said no. And Yosef was running away. And she grabbed his jacket and took a piece of his jacket to blame him for it. And we see here, and they say Yosef was, I think, about 17. He was a young adult. Potiphar's wife was a beautiful woman, very stunning. You know, here's this boy. His brothers sell him. He goes missing. No, the, 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 doesn't even know. Wonders probably why why is my father coming after me? Like all, like Allah panim. You know, in, as they say in Hebrew, nothing, nothing, like dirt on the floor, right? But how? How does he hold his temptation? Because he had this midah of consideration like he was very considerate of where he comes from and they said he had a dream about his father Yaakov that came to him and said this is not something of your level but like imagine even for us to think of a 17 year old being in a situation like that for for five minutes for five minutes we can't even understand it for 12 years they said something so like that he went to prison they said even in the prison Potiphar's wife would go and 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 Hacham Nataneli said she would go purposely undress in front of him, purposely comb his hair. So imagine the level of man, like like manlyhood you have to put aside to see some te such temptation and not give into it, right? And then he, who does he marry? He marries Osnat. And how does he choose Osnat? Osnat was a child that was conceived during from the relationship between Dina and Shechem. And how does she choose? How does he choose them? When the women were walking, they all threw necklaces on Yosef because they said Yosef was such a stunning, good-looking person that they threw these necklaces on him. And he grabs one necklace and he says, "This is a necklace from my father's town. I want to marry her." And he marries Osnat. So then, then they have the four kids, Menashe and Ephraim, who they become the pillar of ideal sibling. Um, what would we should we call the opposite of rivalry? Sibling unity. Maybe that's what we should call it. The oneness of sibling. That in the whole Torah, when you want to relate to the utmost sibling way of interaction, you say your children, like on Friday night when they say the bracha, they say your kids should grow up and be like who? Menashe and Ephraim. In the Galut, in the Mitzrayim, in the middle of nowhere. Yosef and Osnat were able to create children that were filled with joy and respect of Yiddishkeit and have achtut amongst them, even though they lived amongst Mitzrayim. And, and Yaakov was shocked with the way he has raised them. And, and we see that the foundation was what? The healthy relationship between Yosef and Osnat because they had a good connection yeah, because they had a good relationship which this is a big lesson for us that besides the Jewish school that we send our kids and besides everything else that we do one of the most important factors that we have to never forget is the interaction we have with our relationship with our husband that when we disagree when we can't get along when we have our arguments, when we have our anger. And this is a very nice lesson for us to know that feelings are real, right? Whether it's jealousy, anger, resentment, frustration, they're there, but we need to work on it. The Torah doesn't tell us, take it away and don't have it. They're there, but how are you going to channel it? So we learn from here the connection and what it does to our children. And and I was um, 
thinking to myself, when there is that good space for the children that are growing, they grow up in a space of acceptance, compassion, self-care, and self-peace. Even though the world around them doesn't feel like that. Even though you feel the tension. So as, as, a, as, a, as a person, we have to see how we can provide that for our family. But when the children don't have that, then they feel more of a resentment, the expectation, the frustration, and the tension. And I put this um, 10 things together of what I think, I mean, a little bit of my psychology, and that just, just came to me that I feel like whenever we're able to, because people sometimes don't know why they feel the way they feel, or why their spouse feels the way they spouse, or why people do what they do, or why people act the way they act. It all comes from somewhere. Things are not just by chance. So ultimately, we come into this world being very um, selfish because humans are one of the most dependent mammals, creatures in the world. We are more dependent on someone else to take care of us more than a donkey and a camel and a cow. A cow is born, immediately can walk. A donkey is born, immediately can walk and go eat and feed itself. A human being is one of the most incapable, dependent being in the world. However, it's also the most vicious creature. In the animal kingdom, there's no animal that even out of starvation would hurt another of its own kind. Even a tiger, even a lion would never kill another lion to survive. Humans, when it comes down to it, they could be more vicious than an animal. What do I mean by that? They could li reach such a rage in themselves that they can take a gun and kill another human being. Isn't that interesting? Even though we come into this world being so dependent on each other, based on the environment, based on the setting that we grow up in, we could come to a point where we could kill another person and have no feeling towards it. And Sigmund Freud's uncle was saying this is how the Holocaust and stuff came about because when you're able to tap in to that ego, that, that part of that human and take away that compassion, nothing will matter to them. This is what a human is. Human can tap into that egocentric of selfishness that they could come to a point that even their fellow person, even a fellow hurt them and feel no compassion towards it. It shows us how, just like Cain and Heva, look at this, Adam and Chava have two kids, one kills the other without any remorse. So humans have that more than mammals. They have the ability of compassion and they have the ability of no remorse right so then what does that teach us so when you are brought up in the world in a dynamic where you have and all you need is one attachment figure and that person doesn't even have to always be your mom obviously the birth to three years is the most critical time and i think this is why yosef was so amazing because his hers early years he had that connection with um rachel you know look at us we always oh. So we know he was six years old before Benjamin was born. And Yaakov met Esav when Yaakov met Esav. Rachel was pregnant on Benjamin. So minimum, I would say maybe six or seven. Because as soon as Benjamin was born, she passed away. So I'm saying, so you know how most of us complain where my husband is never involved, my husband works all the time. Rachel's husband had three other wives, you know? It's a big lesson. It's really a big lesson for us. Like, do I constantly bicker about what's not there? Or do I glorify what is there? Do I constantly put down what I don't have from my husband? Or do I take what I have and create the best of it? Like, one of the main promises I made to myself, because, like, you know, the Persian culture, they're very comfortable becoming friends with their kids. Like, they think, for some odd reason, that it's okay to just like kind of like um, open up your heart and let your children know about everything that's going on with you. Like there's no hierarchy that your children are not your therapist, they're not your friends, they're not your companion. Like they should not know about the challenges you're having. 
No matter what, that person is their father, and no matter what, that person is their mother. This is not the space. So I am sure that Rachel did not go to tell Yosef, how could he do this to me? How could that one do this to me? Who was the only one that intervened more than he should have? Reuven. Reuven went to the field and got the Dudaim. After Rachel passed away, went and took Yaakov's bed and put it in his mom's tent. And, and Yaakov said, you disrespected me as if you slept with your... Um, yeah, like, I mean, this is, what, this is a lesson that we learned. I don't know what was going on between Leah and Reuven. I don't know if he felt that sense of responsibility. But we learn a lesson from everything. This is not their place. It's not their kid's place to make shalom between us. It's not the kid's place to make... It's not the kid's place to be told that I am only staying with your father because of you. You know, there's like a lot of boundary crossing that what we learn... What, it's very true. Like, nobody really talks about it. It's like, why did Ruben even know about it? Yeah, like, like someone like, must have said something yeah. to him to be able that he was so sensitive over his mother... Why is my mom not first? Why is my mom someone, you know, must have said something to him. So, the, but the lesson we're learning from this is these are not worthy behaviors that we want to follow. We want to make sure to have our boundaries. Share with God, share with your journal, share with your good friend. Do not sabotage that relationship. And even when the kids come and bag, bad mouth the other parent, you listen, you create an empathetic space for them. But however, you never agree to put the other person... Again, this is in a normal setting. I'm not talking about the crazy situations. But I'm just saying, in a normal setting, you empathize. You hear them out. You say, you know, this is, you know, this is the best way he knows how to do this. This is the best... Because what are, you, you want to say a statement that if it gets back to the spouse, it's not played out as a, as a way of a put-down. Because... You want to keep the face, you know, you want to keep that unit between you. You could disagree, you have your arguments, but it never should, the kids should never see you as a two separate entity. That no matter what, we're a partner and together we're your parents. We need to try our almost to portray that. So I was saying that I think what leads to that good, healthy relationship is when, when people have that healthy setting, should we go through the bad one first or the good one? The good one we should first start. Okay. So I think the people that had that healthy attachment state in the early years are usually the people that are more present. They have more compassionate. They're more compassionate. They have access to their empathy. And this is what research is showing now is that children do not come into this world being empathetic. They have to learn how to access empathy in their brain. You're not just born having empathy. If you don't learn how to access it and utilize it, you freeze in that stage. And the birth to three years is the ideal time for you to develop that emotional intelligence for empathy, compassion, and consideration, and common sense. So how do you do that for like such a young kid? So by, by, by providing it for them. That when they ask you, when they want something, oh, that you're present for them. Yeah. Your relationship is what enhancing that part of the brain. So every time you make contact, if it's a, if it the only time is to feed and to change, and even then you're not present, so that part of the brain doesn't get activated. By present we Sorry. mean, by, by present we mean when you're changing their diaper, you have full eye contact with that empathy. I'm here because to take care of you. The child, this is a spooky research, they did an MRI scan, Garber, Garber Mate has a talk about it, that they did a MRI scan of brain of kids who are six months old, of depressed moms versus non-depressed mom. The, the MRI scan of the moms who had depressed depression, their brain wave of their babies was different than the moms who were not diagnosed with depression. The MRI showed a difference. Why? Because a mother who's depressed, who's anxious, anxious, she doesn't have to do anything. But simply by looking at the eyes of the baby, the baby picks that up. That's why when I personally go sh to Shiurim and I hear the speaker say, you have to stay with your child. Stay at home. You don't know. Stay, stay. And I'm sitting there saying everyone to their own. I always say, I, 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 
Every time I hear that, I say, I'm sorry. I beg to differ. Everyone to their own capacity. Everyone to their own capacity. There are some women who could be home with their child for half an hour and fully be there. And there's another mom that could be full-time home and have give a tablet to the child, feel the resentment, don't even look at it. What do you think is going to affect the child more? That mother that went, you know, again, I'm not telling people what to do. Whoever is watching this, whoever is here, I'm just saying you got to be truthful with yourself and with your inner self. What your child needs is abundance of love, affection, and empathy. And if you think like you're getting checked out or you're not there or, or having that go, your kids need to have someone that's present, that's there, that's doing the story time, that's doing the eye contact. It, it, it really makes a difference to give that to your child. So I was saying pay, they have more patience, affectionate. They, ha they know how to praise, you know, like they know how to be praised and give praise because they saw it growing up kindness they have a sense of belonging a sense of consideration and they are able to hold space for all their feelings because they were brought up with a mother or father who was able to hold space for their feelings i put hold space for their meaning when a mother is angry yeah. when, when the child is angry the mother is able to hold space for that okay i understand you're feeling angry with my decision so i'm very into this like space concept like uh, garbor mate speaks a lot about people who have self-esteem issues have a hard time holding space or taking space that they think like it's better for them not exist i'm okay i'm fine but they're really not like because if you have a value of yourself you're comfortable with taking space just like when god told like i told you adam adam immediately oh, can you see what they want when 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 you're coming when god when god told when when is your sister here too you could okay you, you want to tell her you're here so she doesn't go thank you yeah. so when when god told adam where are you what did adam say adam i mean when god asked adam what did you do what did adam say we just discussed it this is the wife, the wife. i call it the flashlight effect you know yeah. god you know but when God called out to Abraham, what did Abraham say? The mirror effect. I love martial. I love examples. Analogies, they say in English. I love analogy. Like, there are the people who live life with a flashlight. What, like, uh, you all, we all, I mean, siblings, kids, you say, you say, why is this here? You know, you have all those kids that say, well, she did it. You know, the flashlighters. And then you have the mirror kids. Mommy, I'll help you pick it up. You know, the mirror kids are all about, what can I do to help with this situation? The flashlighters are all like, boom, 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 you know? So Abraham took space. Going back to the taking space concept, I feel like the taking space is like, Hineni, I'm here, I exist, and I'm okay. I can take space for that, and that's okay. I'm allowed to take space, and that's fine with it. And when I'm able to take space i take responsibility i'm able to be there so that's what i mean by taking space when you were brought up with a mother or a father or an attachment or somebody that allowed you to take space then as an adult you come to a place where you could hold space for yourself you could hold space for other people and you could give space to others but when you didn't have that it's a very hard language like a lot of times people think marriage is just about getting married but there's so much that comes with it that you don't know unless you're in it they bring their package you bring your package so now we're going to go to the other side what happens when you I, I came up with this analogy myself i have no it's just my own i was talking to him that i think like yourself is um, such a righteous person and I think a lot of it has to do with that compassion that Rachel and Yaakov had and therefore they conceived Yosef and how Yosef and his wife were able to create the kids that they had so um, so one of it is um, so the opposite of it would be they're detached people that did not have that they're detached they can't be present like they cannot be in the moment you know they're always busy they're always doing things they have a very hard time being in the Hineni mode um, they're fighters instead of like being compassionate they're fighters they get defensive very fast they're constantly in a survival mode you know they always feel like they're 
they, they, they just need to like survive, you know, like someone is going to come at them and anxiety is higher, tension is higher, they're more critical instead of giving praise, they're more strict and rigid, they're more um, disconnected from their own emotion, so besides being detached from, you know, they're disconnected from their own feelings also, um, they're very self-driven because all they want to do is protect themselves. Because why? Because when they grew up as a baby, they never felt like anyone held space for them. So they grow up feeling like their only mode is to take care of themselves. Nobody's going to take care of me. And they're in complete denial. You know how I was saying about holding space? So the other group would be there in denial. They're in denial of their feelings, of other people's feelings. So they become very defensive even when you talk about feelings. So like with Yosef, when the brother said, how can you do that to us? Like, I mean, how can you tell us we're going to bow down to you? Who are you that we're going to bow down to you? They take him, they dump him in the, they want to sell him. And then they throw him in there in the dungeon that they decide to sell him instead. But he had such a, a such a, a in tuned attachment that he never blamed people in his life. You know, he never did a flashlight effect. He said that everything comes from Hashem. Everything is destined from him. So he never blamed the brothers for it. And that's why he was able to hold, hold space for their jealousy. He was able to hold peace for their resentment. And that's why when they came to Mitzrayim, he was able to take care of them with a pure heart. And he even did, went to a higher level of making everyone in Mitzrayim circumcised that God forbid that their brothers should feel out of place. Can you imagine that? They always made him feel out of place. They always bullied him. They always put him down. They always belittled him. They always made him feel... But when he came to a place of hierarchy, when his dream came true, he knew who has his back? God. Yosef always felt like... God had his back. And not only that, another attribute of um, Yosef that we see is that he was very in tune with his tears and with his sadness. We learn about Yosef's crying over 13 to 14 times. So Yosef was very in tune with his sadness. He holds space for his feeling of sadness. He didn't go into anger. He didn't break anything. He didn't fight. He didn't hurt. He didn't break. He didn't attack. What did he do? He holds space for his feelings and connected back to godliness, which is a huge attribute for us to learn about what does it mean to be righteous? What does it mean to be on tzaddik, you know? What does it really mean? It means when you're able to come to a point in your life, my grandmother would say, you have to come to, like I would tell my grandmother when she had to go to a rehab, I would say, Grandma, aren't you alone when none of us come to visit you? And she would say, I'm never alone. I'm man chodam chodai chodam. There is me and there is my God. When I have it, when it's me and my God, how can I ever be alone? And I have so much to do. And I'm like, dude, you're like 90 plus. Like, what do you, you know? She's like, I'm going to be, do, like, I, I, she would do her tehillim. She would do these crocheting bag, like, nonstop. She would have these phone call lists of, like, people that she would check on that no one ever cared to check on them. Baruch Hashem, she was, like, 96 years old. She was, um, she went into coma for a month. And thank God Hashem had rachmanut on her that it didn't prolong longer than that. She was a doer. She was a constant doer. But she always felt like there's something to give. And she never held grudge against anyone. She was very forgiving. Like the attribute of Yosef, that is his midah of being forgiving. And another interesting story is today when I was listening to this story of um, Yosef. And so I like sat in the car and I'm like, you know, Hashem, if you had the destiny to give me more kids, I really would love to have a son. And I would name him Yosef because Yosef is one of our... And Baruch Hashem, we have this beautiful organization. It's called Children's Village Advocacy. And as I'm sitting in my zone, you know, I'm having this thought about one of the kids that we had that when he came to, uh, he had an English name. And when we were able to, like, find a Jewish placement for him, he went and he came and told us that my name, my Hebrew name is Yosef. And I want to be called that. My father is a Kohen, and I want to be called that. And I'm one of our dear amazing foster moms her name is anna she's the most amazing lady she's been a foster over like 10 to 11 years 
and Baruch Hashem has been living with her and they went into like adopting a beautiful message so I'm like sitting there I just had this zone of like meditation I'm sitting there listening to the Tabar Torah and I'm like you know what God even though I did not officially get blessed I'm so happy that I was able to have like a connection and be like a screw of linkage of that child when he needed a placement to be placed with you know our our foster mom and thank God is living in a Jewish home I'm like the, I'm just like rocking and having this meditation and my phone rings and it's a 213 number most of the DCFS offices call this is like happened today like I, you're not even hearing this a second hand so because my car was parked because I was sitting there I see the phone call and for a moment I'm like maybe it's from DCFS I pick it up Hi, can I speak to Natalie Zangon? Yes, this is Natalie Zangon. Hi, this is social worker. Mm -hmm. um, I'm calling you regarding this case we have. We need a respite for these two Jewish kids. My mouth literally drops. Like, they have a list. Like, you know, they're just... So, show, she has a list of agencies. She goes through them. You don't pick up. She goes to the next one and gets them placed, and that's it. So, they don't give... They don't, like, go out of their way. So, what happens... It happens that she brought up that these kids are Jewish. Another lady down the office tells her, actually, I know this woman, Natalie, who is an advocate, and this is what she deals with. So it happened to be Mina Shamaim that I parked the car to listen to this Davar Torah. I go into my zone of Yosef. I turn off the car. I'm there, and as soon as the phone call, I'm like, you guys, like, don't understand the magnitude. People who understand DCFS, like, understand well, that, like, scary. Not only that, it's like, like, their whole life. It's like not, that. not first of all, it's like that. Second of all, you have to earn yourself up as an agency that they even would recognize to call you. You have to earn your way up. Like th there's like so many of these agencies that have been around for years, but a good, it's like Yad Hashem, literally Besyata Dishmaya to the max. Like you really have to be on a place of like of the glory of God that that you that you are able to like have them to recognize you you have to be recognized for them to even give you minute of a day so then they called me and Baruch Hashem like one of our families got referred the kids are Hebrew speaking so um, she'll she'll fill you in with the but um it, it was like be, you know how they say being at the right place at the right time literally like after she hung up the phone I'm like whoa that was crazy like that was not out of this was an experience out of this world like and thank god they're like talking to each other and hopefully Bezrat Hashem they're gonna get placed with and our motto is with the children's village advocacy is that to create less trauma let's try to get the place the kids placed with a similar culture language and religion and we try to advocate no matter what it is but like one of our main ones is the Jewish community because we have a closer connection with it so this is the media of consideration Consider are these kids like only in LA? Uh, no we've gotten oh, international right. calls too wow. we've gotten cases internationally it's crazy like you don't understand a good name and achtud when you are a representation of consideration literally god moves things around we had a case in Tor toronto canada a year and a half ago somehow the number got around this lady from toronto called us and we were able to like get in through the community and thank god you know and it, it's like with these things it's literally being a village not just for the child and also for the mother that's going through it but it was like mina shamayim to the max and bezra Hashem, like god willing this week they're supposed to um do the meeting and like have the kids transfer but what i'm saying is that this is what the middle of consideration teaches us about the importance so we're gonna finish up this part and then we're gonna do our dough making and then we're gonna call a night